Pike by Ted Hughes. So before I'm going to explain to you about the poem itself, I'm going to talk to you about how to answer a typical IGCXE paper for literature. So you have to follow the format of title, structure, setting, you analyze and quote, and also find the effects through stylistic devices. So then you talk about the themes and also the tone and mood. And lastly, you conclude. So Pike was written by Ted Hughes, who also was called Edward James. And he was born in the Yorkshire district. When he was young, he changed his housing location and moved to the south of the Yorkshire. And the landscape of the area made his view and perspective of literature change. So when he was young, his dad used to bring him fishing in a lake nearby. And as a child, he was always scared of the pike, the fish. And so this is what made him write the poem. And we will discover how this affected his life and how even when he wrote the poem itself 50 years later, that image still affected his perspective. So then you can see a comparison between his childhood and what he is now. So Pike, so as I said, I will start with the title because that's how you're supposed to write. So the title of the poem shows what the poem will be about, which is Pike the Fish. The author makes use of his memory and specific knowledge to describe the fish. Unlike other romantic poets, Ted Hughes does not depict a positive image of nature or an idealistic picture of it. We see that he makes use of mankind in the center of the poem to show comparison. In this poem, it is shown how the pike can be observed on the bed of emerald, objectively as seen in stanza 1, line 1 and 2, but also subjectively as seen in stanza 2, line 1. So, Pike is made up of 11 quatrains and the rhyming scheme is irregular. This shows that there is something negative about this fish, as 11 is an odd number. This feeling is confirmed when we learn that they are killers from the egg. So, the poem is divided in three parts, which are three changing perspectives. The first part, from stanza 1 to stanza 2, describes the nature of the fish in an almost significant manner. This is seen in stanza 1, line 1, and in stanza 2, line 1 to 4. The second part, stanza 3 to 7, illustrates the predatory nature of the pike and how their body structure highlights their aggressive nature. This is seen in stanza 3, line 1 and 3. Concerning the final part, which is stanza 8 to stanza 11, this stanza shows a personal encounter between the narrator and the pike. All this is done to give an in-depth of a fish description. So now we will analyze some kind of line-by-line -line analysis. So pike three inches long, perfect, pike in all parts, green tiring the gold, killers from the egg, the malevolent aged green, they dance on the surface among the flies. So we see three inches long. What can be said about this? Three inches is an odd number so therefore negative connotation so 
then we see pike in all parts green tiring the gold so we see the use of green and gold colors so then wait a second I'm going to move it here to change the font a bit too small let's say here good so then we see a negative connotation the colors So we get a vivid image about how the pike looks like. Killers from the egg. Already the word killers from, a, from the egg gives us another negative image. So then there's an allusion to the pike as being a killer. We can also see that we are personifying the pike as killers the malevolent H. Green so we can see the lexical field of danger the dents on the surface among the flies yeah we can we can analyze this into a metaphor Because they dance on the surface among the flies. We see how we can also make use of a personification. Now, next line. All move, stand by their own grandeur, over a bed of emerald silhouette of submarine delicacy and horror, a hundred feet long. In their world so here what we can analyze is we can analyze the delicacy and horror because delicacy and horror are two contradictory terms which we can classify as an oxymoron or anti so the effect is to see how nature can be something good but also can hide its mystery a hundred feet long in their world it's a hyperbole to depict how big the fish is so therefore as reader we feel scared next in ponds under the heat stuck lily pads bloom of their stillness logged on last year black leaves watching upwards or hung in an amber cavern of weed so here we can analyze the black leaves black connotes danger fear and danger as readers we can already see that the poem might or will finish through the theme of death we don't know yet because we're still on the third paragraph stanza sorry so they're watching upwards so the element of suspense this one let's change it again to 10 no let's say 17 18 so there's the element of suspense through watching upwards amber cavern of weeds so there's a vivid 
image and description of how the area and the pond looks like. The jaws, hooked, clamp and fangs not to be changed at this date. A life subbed to its instrument, the gills kneading quietly and the pectorals. So again, we have a very negative description and opinion of the pike if their jaws are hooked, clamped and fangs. So what can we say about this? It's something very scary. Already we have a negative opinion of the pike because we don't know what will happen. So then we have um, as a stylistic device, what can we say? So here there's a comparison. So you can see here, clangs and fangs, it's a comparison. So then there's the reference of the word date, which can symbolize that it was something which existed since long ago. And still, even today, it's still something which is a predatory animal. And it's very dangerous. The fact that there's life and date, which we can classify under lexical field of time. So this shows that we don't know about nature. We only see a facade of nature, but we don't know what nature is hiding. There is needing quietly. Quietly, so again, you see the element of fear, fear imagery. Because already you see the black leaves, and now under you see the fish quietly roaming around. So again, we, as reader, we feel very scared. We don't know what might happen to us if we go there. So again, we can analyze this for more points. Again here you see various parts of the body. You have pectorals, gills. So again we have we can also we can foreshadow this in the analytical part of the theme of nature. So we can see we can see how we don't know what might happen and again you have read which can be again related to nature leaves also here ponds here also next three we kept behind glass triple in weed three inches four and four and a half fed fry to them suddenly there were two, finally one. With a sag belly and the grin it was born with, and indeed they spared nobody. Two six pounds each, over two feet long, high and dry and dead in the willow herb. So again, what can we talk about here? Number three. Odd number negative connotation and then three again the number three so three inches so again we have a negative image about the pike and four and a half so then we see four the number four is a number alone in itself, but by adding half, we already see that there's something missing. So the half shows that they will eat each other and kill themselves. 
So then again, you can see suddenly there were two, finally one. So then you see the element of suspense, death, they're eating each other. So then there's the survival of the fittest. So that's part of the nature element. So the one who is stronger will survive and the less strong persons or people or even in, the, in this context, fishes or animals, they would die. So we can see how the author tried to implement his knowledge of nature and what he might know about the people him, themselves. So we have a sack belly. So then again, we have an imagery. It's a vivid image to show how they look like. Born with, so then we see that the predator since they were born. It's not like when they grow up and then they become dangerous. Since they are young, they kill. They spare nobody. Again, there's a dramatic suspense and element of drama. So they spare nobody. So when you die, when you die, that's it. So you can't say, oh, I'm stronger, so then I will survive. They kill everything from small to big, from big to large. Everything is dead. Two six pounds each. No, this is not very important. Dry and dead alliteration of a D sound, which symbolize danger. Next. One jump past its gills down the other's gullet. The outside eye stared as a vice locks. The same iron in the eye through its film shrank in death. A pond I fished 50 yards across. Whose lilies and muscular trench had outlasted every visible stone of the monastery that planted them. So then we see how very barbaric they can be. Because if you can read the first line here, it's very barbaric what they do. So then again, we, we don't know what nature can make us discover. It's very direful to see what is happening in those conditions. They kind of risk themselves in the peril of dying. So we see the outside eye stared, the element of suspense, theme of danger and death. Again, they are com compared to a simile. Because remember, simile is when you make use of the word as or like. When you don't compare with as or like, then it's a metaphor. Again, you see the word death. Death symbolizes danger. Because they are dying, so then you don't know who might kill you. Because they live in a world of barbarism. So now, if we go to the next stanza, we see personal reflection. The author is telling us about how once he fished, because there's the use of I, personal pronoun, so then he's talking about himself. He fished one, and then... Let's go to the next stanza to understand it better. Still legendary depth. It was as deep as England. It held pike, too immense to steer, so immense and old that past nightfall I dared not cast. But silently cast and fished, with the hair frozen on my head, for what might move, for what might for what I might move. The still splashes on the dark pond. I think there's a mistake in this poem. But let's just continue our analysis. It was as deep as England. It's a simile. Because 
a fish can be as deep as England. So then it's a hyperbole indeed, because it's a bit, not a bit, it's very much exaggerated and it's an allusion to England. So you have three stylistic devices in only one line. So this line should be very, very well analyzed and annotated when you're writing your exams, if ever you have this poem. Man, and then you have the repetition of the word immense. Immense. Something cannot be that immense. And too immense. So then it's very hyperbolic in the, its language. So then you should analyze this. Nightfall, I dared not cast. Nightfall, so then again we see the element of suspense, which can be classified as under a theme, theme of fear and theme of danger. So again we can see a comparison between the previous stanzas and this one. But silently, but, the word but is a bit not part of this poem, it's a conjunction, so therefore we should analyze this as well. With the hair frozen on my head, it's a bit hyperbolic. You can't froze, you can't have the hair frozen on my head, it's very ridiculous, so then it must have been something very, very scary, so again the element of suspense, theme of danger, fear. You see frozen fear? You can analyze. For one might move, might move, alliteration of the M sound to show the movement. Again, you have a repetition of the word move. The still splash in the dark. Dark. You see, it was, I think, night, or maybe it's in the day that he's talking about this. Because if the pond itself is full of danger, it would be dark. So therefore, we have another imagery, the dark imagery, to symbolize evilness, to show how the fish are not human. They don't have feelings or emotions. They're just there killing, killing and killing. There's no love or affection. You can't love these fishes because we can see that the author actually has admiration for them but in real life something like that shouldn't be allowed to roam in the pond. They should be imprisoned in some pond, some prison pond, I don't know what. Owls hushing in the floating woods, frail on my ear against the dream, darkness beneath night, darkness had freed, but rose slowly toward me, watching. Mm -hmm. This is very, very interesting. Hushing. It's an onomatopoeia. It's a play of word. Because, so then we can also say it's actually a metaphor, a you can all analyze those words. Again, we see the use of ear. So before we can see, we're talking about hair, face. Now you have the ear. So it's the use of the body parts to compare the fish. So then it's a metaphor. No, yes, it's not actually comparing the fish. He's talking about himself. So then... We can relate this to here, the lexical field of the human body to show how scared he was. And then you have darkness. Darkness was never something admired as something positive. It's mostly negative. So then again, we see there's the element of suspense because they are both watching each other. You see the fish watching him while he is watching the fish. You don't know who will survive. Will he attack the fish? Or will the fish attack him? So then we can deeply analyze this through the human and animal sense. Because you don't know who will win, the animal, so then nature, or human. Who is stronger, the humans or, the na or nature? 
because we are mankind, we create everything, but before it was nature ruling us, and it's still the case, because here you see, nature is actually dominating the author, while the author thinks he's also dominating nature. You don't know who will win after this. So now let's talk about the atmosphere. The atmosphere of the poem is threatening and tense. This is seen in the first stanza with a scientific description of the pike. Let's go see this. You see, there's the scientific description. The presence of a synesthesia in line 2 highlights the predatory characteristics of the fish through the word tigering. Throughout the poem, we discover more about the physical and psychological characteristics of the fish, whereby they spare nobody. Towards the end of the last stanza, this sense and tense atmosphere prevails through the presence of an onomatopoeia without hushing. Hushing sound reinforces the feeling of fear as something that grows slowly towards the speaker is watching in the end and we do not know who is watching who. The tone used in the poem is aggressive. This is seen in stanza 1 with a repetition of the word pike. So again, we can analyze this very in depth. So then now we have analyzed the tone. Again, if you feel that there is something missing, you can still add on. So let's continue the analysis. The fish is not ordinary, but one which has a malevolent age grin. Their violent nature is therefore hereditary. The aggressive tone is also seen when the speaker describes how two pike killed each other in an attempt to end each other. This, is, this can be seen in stanza 7. The simile in line 2, where the teeth of the pike is compared to vice locks, illustrate this aggressiveness. In, we can see the aggressive tone can be sensed through the admiration in the tone of the speaker in stanza 2, line 3. The speaker subjectively comments on the movement of the fish by using an antithesis in the words delicacy and horror. In doing so, the speaker is beautifying the characteristics of a predator in stanza 2, the water they live is compared to a bed of emerald. When the speaker looks from above the water, the shadow of the pike seems to magnify and appear a hundred feet long. The theme of nature is significant as nature is not idealized in other romantic poems. In the in these poems, the survival of the fittest is predominant as it is the law of the jungle. The word jungle, stanza 4, line 4, suggests this, is fur suggests this. It is further seen when the speaker puts three pike in an aquarium and finally one survives. While the dark side of nature is depicted, its richness is also highlighted. This is seen through the word gold, emerald, stands at two line two, and amber stands at three line four. These words remind us that nature is a treasure. Nature is shown to be very much alike. This is seen through the alliteration line three, stands at ten where the emphasis on the M sound is used to reinforce the idea that the pike constantly move as they are predator. Their movement frightened the reader who used a metaphor on the pike to describe his fear in stanza 10, line 2. The theme of time helps us to show that the pike is almost a prehistorical creature. This is seen through the repetition of immense in stanza 1, line 3, the effect is to highlight why the speaker dared not cast, which is a quote, actually. The simile in stanza 9, line 2, 
is important as the point in which the old pike lives is as deep as England. Here the speaker uses the point to reflect upon time and its importance on men. The simile helps us to highlight that men have the same predatory instinct as the pike because England has had a history filled with violence and war. World War I, World War II and other wars. At the end of this poem, the speaker becomes less conscious of extreme factors in nature which would indicate time. This is seen through words like night darkness. In doing so, the speaker is made to reflect on his own predatory instincts as he is the one invading the pike's world to fish it. So we can see how this poem was done. So I thank you all for listening and watching this video. And I hope you pass IGCSE with an A star like me. Yeah, I got an A star for the 2014 November paper.